So we've been in this stuff about acceptance, and as we get into a conversation time about acceptance of myself, I want to read again the pieces that comes out of the, out of the big book, and it says this, acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm disturbed, it's because I find some person, place, or thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me, and that includes who? Me, right? And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation, or me, as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. It's kind of like, you know, in recovery, it's like, well, a phrase I like is, wherever I go, there I am. You know, and I can have a, I can make up my mind that life sucks in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I can move to, I don't know, pick a spot, Orlando, and go down there and be with Mickey. But the problem is, when I go down and hang out with Mickey, the deal is I'm still there. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not really capable of running from myself. I can try, but I always end up boomeranging, don't I? And sooner or later, I end up finding myself again. It's kind of what happens to me. Because wherever I go, there I am. So it's kind of like another way to say what I just read out of that paragraph is this. is like, look, I am, when I'm having a struggle in my life, when stuff is going on in my life, I got to check myself and ask myself, am I my problem? Right? That's what that's really saying is my acceptance of people, places, and things really causes me to be kind of my problem in the way that I handle what's in front of me. It's not that somebody else is my problem, although I would like that. It's not that the circumstances in front of me are my problem. I would like that. It's not that things are my problem. I would like that or the absence of them. It is that the way I'm handling any of that stuff is my problem. So tonight we're going to talk about what about me is my problem. There's a guy that um, Matt Kittrell was telling me about that I, I remember this guy when he told me about him, but his name, his name, and he's told this story in public, but his name is Chris Heron. And Chris Heron was an NBA, NBA athlete, played for a few years with several different teams. And Chris Heron tells a story about his recovery that his wife, and I put this picture up, yeah, his wife one day finds on their um, counter in their bathroom his toothbrush and his razor. And she says to him, man, where have those been? Like, I haven't seen those suckers in a long time. And Chris goes, well, the reason they're out here is this is the first day that I've been able to look at myself. Like, in other words, the way he had been living his life was that he was so ashamed of himself, right, that he shaved in the shower and brushed his teeth in the shower because that way he didn't have to look at himself in the mirror. And, man, there's a lot of that going on for us. And I'm telling you, that right there, an inability to accept me as me and, and even deeper, which is what we're going to get into tonight, an inability for me to love me or to be loved. Listen, this cuts across every line, doesn't it? I mean, we can sit here in a church this Sunday and we can go, with those that, I mean, we, people, I mean, I don't know what would happen if we did this. I think it'd be kind of cool. But we say, you know, uh, anybody in this room that's got a chemical dependency issue right now this morning, please stand up. Well, some people probably, most of people in recovery would stand up and go, yeah, that's me and I'm grateful. I'm a grateful recovering addict. That would shock other people in the church. They'd be like, God, I'm so glad I'm not that sucker. That's good right there. But then if I moved on and I said, you know, I said, Let, let's do this. Anybody in this room ever had a problem with, with esteem issues? You ever had a problem with the way you look? Any of you women today in church, this would really get it. Any of you women today like having a problem with, um, you know, like, let's just say a bad hair day? I mean, if you're a guy, if you're a guy and you're having a bad hair day and you're actually acknowledging it, sucks for you. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, don't do it, man. Don't do it. Don't let it deteriorate to that, Stacy. Don't. But I mean, if we said that, more people would stand up. If we went deeper and we said, how many of you think when you looked in the mirror this morning, you weigh too much, you weigh too little, your body distribution isn't the way you want it, you look like you have bags under your eyes, you look like you're getting older, you look like 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the whole conversation was just physical. How many more people would stand up, do you think? A lot, wouldn't it? And then what would happen if I said, let's try something else? This is when nobody would stand up. I say, how many of you inside have a part of your spirit inside that actually feel like you are more than suspect? That someday you're gonna go to work and your boss is gonna call you out because actually this new thing you're supposed to be doing at work, you don't have any freaking idea what you're doing. Has that ever happened to you? And you kind of go to work and you remember like it was in the third grade. And in the third grade, you perfected the fine art of keeping your head down at the desk so the teacher wouldn't call on you, right? And now all well, the problem is that worked okay in the third grade, but how do you put your head in the desk when it's not there and you're at work because you're overwhelmed and you have no idea what you're doing? Most people, when it comes to technology, it's the weirdest thing. They're, they're very prideful. You know, like me, I want to figure out how to do it. So I'll just say, I have no clue how to do this. Can you turn me on how to do this? But I know a lot of other people that they kind of, they're fumbling, bumbling around with a computer or a phone or whatever. They don't have any freaking clue how to do what they're supposed to do. Right? And you go, can I help you? And they go, no, it's okay. I got it. <laughs> I got it. Like, so what if you made everybody in church that's insecure about something they don't know stand up? What if we did that? That'd be some more people, wouldn't it? What if we said, how many people in this room really feel like they don't deserve very much out of people in their lives or out of stuff in this world because they're not good inside, they're broken inside, they're guilty inside, they're ashamed of themselves inside, the people, if they're, if they're in a place where they're, where they're married, they don't feel like they deserve their spouse, and they worry every day, and it's amazing how many people I've talked to that have told me this. They worry every day that they're not good enough for their spouse and that their spouse might leave them. They worry every day that they're not gonna be good enough moms or dads for their kids. They worry every day that they're not gonna be good enough friends. They worry every day that they're not gonna be good enough. And they struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with the internals of that. And nobody else knows. And they're living in that personal hell every day because they really don't know or will not accept what they are worth. You ask people in dating relationships, men, how, how did you meet that guy? I mean, that guy is jacked up. What are you doing? And they're like, well, you know what? Uh, I mean, good codependents go, well, you know, I was just, I mean, I see something good in him. It's like. <laughs> what? Uh, huh, what is it? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to help him. I mean, I'm trying to help him. It's like, wow, where, that comes from that gut that says this is what I deserve. This is the way I deserve to be treated. If you were abused and you were seven, you're 17 and you still believe somehow it was your fault and you deserve to be abused some more. Moreover, if it's not somebody else who's abusing you right now, you're more than willing to do a fine job of abusing yourself because that is what you believe you are worth. I felt so bad about myself, he said, that I couldn't, even, I couldn't even look. You know, when I wake up in the morning, what my job is at that point in my life, if that's the way I see myself, if I have an in, just complete inability to accept me and to love me, it's a big piece of the Bible that's gonna talk about this in a minute. I can't love me, I just can't love me. My job when I wake up is to wake up to find out a way to tune myself out to tune out the pain about myself that I feel. And the harder I try that day, the worse I get. And I don't look at myself as being attractive. If you ask people that are having a problem with an eating disorder, do you know that the, the vast majority of people with an eating disorder are actually, when they develop an eating disorder, are actually already underweight? Did you know that? Did you know that this disease of eating disorders affects as many men in this room as it does women? 
Because when a man who's six foot four looks in the mirror, because of the shame he feels about himself inside, he looks at the mirror, he's six foot four inches tall, he weighs 205 pounds, and he believes he's fat. And he's trying to figure out a way to lose it. And you're like, man, I'm looking right at him. It's like, I know you are. But he isn't seeing what you're seeing. And she isn't seeing what you're seeing. And you can tell a woman who's got an eating disorder for six months how beautiful they are, how attractive they are, all of that. And that woman is absolutely hearing a ringing in her ears because in her world, she is no good. She is not attractive and she's overweight. That's what the hell of being captured by a rejection of myself does to us. And God says, man, here's how you gotta do it. You gotta love me. You gotta love other people. And here it comes, here it comes. And you gotta love yourself. Do you know that it is impossible to be in a free relationship with somebody else where you can enjoy them and be in an intimate relationship with them until you come to terms with how to love yourself. There's gonna be big pieces missing. There's gonna be big pieces missing. Because see, every argument, every conversation, every piece of conflict in my marriage, in my relationships, in my life, it's gonna be devastating because they all take out more chunks of me, amen? Are you following that? All of them count more. It's more chips off of me. It's more value off of me. I'm worth less and less and less and less and less because I don't have a stopping point. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And a bunch of us, I, don't, I have been here, man. A bunch of us in this room, if we're honest, we have been at some place in our life where we absolutely did not know how to do that. Amen? And that right there is a dangerous place because you've got the enemy, the liar, who is more than willing on the day when I look at the mirror and I go, man, I just... You know, I don't have it. I mean, I'm not a very good dad. I failed my kids. I failed my work. I'm failing my relationships. I'm failing in my, in my health. I'm just failing as me. I don't have it together. And the enemy's gonna go, you know what? You're right, you don't. You don't. Why don't you go ahead and just take some more pieces out of yourself and die some more? The purpose of the enemy in your life is to convince you that spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental death is acceptable. That is a lie. The purpose of the enemy is to convince you one way or another that physical, emotional, spiritual, or mental death is acceptable. And see, the contrast to that, what we're here to talk about tonight is the steps that we just read. And the steps are all about what? Acceptance of God, right? Acceptance of God, acceptance of other people, and acceptance of myself. Do you think when you look in the mirror, if you could risk it tonight, if you really looked in the mirror and really looked at yourself, you know, and looked beyond the bad hair day and all that, do you think, do you think when you look at the mirror, that you see yourself tonight exactly the way that God is looking at you. Do you think, you know, have you, have you ever had somebody come up behind you, you know, and like you're sitting there and you're fidgeting, you're nervous, you had an interview or you yeah, got something going on and you gotta really think about what you're wearing and all that, you know, and, uh, you just can't get it right. Have you ever had a day like that where everything you're agitated by, just agitated by everything to do with you? You're just agitated by you. You are your agitation. That's a hellish day, man. But there you are. And somebody comes up behind you and they go, you know, you really look good. You actually, you really do look good. And you're like, 
you still only believe it about 5%, but you'll take it. You'll take it. I remember, and I was very fortunate, I was very fortunate to grow up in a family situation where when I would fall completely on my face, you know, and fail at something in every direction possible, I had parents that would come up behind me and help me get up and tell me that they loved me and tell me that it wasn't over and tell me there was going to be another day and tell me that they, you know, they were, they were convinced that things were going to get better. And I don't know if they believed it or not, but I needed to hear it. But see, I know that tonight, if you didn't have parents like that, I know Jesus wants to come up behind you while you're looking at yourself in the mirror, while you think you're a loser, while you think you're not attractive, while you think you can't do anything effective, while you think you're not a good person, while you think you're just a, a ragged mess, and Jesus wants to come up behind you tonight and look at you face to face in the same mirror you're looking at so you see his face behind yours and he wants to say to you, hold on there, partner, I love you. Amen. I died for you. I wanna talk to you about you because the way you see you, this is important, the way you see you isn't the way I see you. The way you see you is you're done and washed up. The way I see you is as a redeemed child of mine who I'm gonna take into this brand new life that you can't even imagine. And you don't have that hope, but I do. And so stop worrying about the hope that you don't have and start using mine. Start using mine. Is it possible that Jesus sees more of me than I see of me? Man, absolutely. It's not only possible, but it's true. See, here's the thing. I am not and you are not my disease. Even if tonight your disease is overpowering you, you are not your disease. There is more to you than your disease. There is more to you than your disease. There's a child of God in there. There's a redeemed child of God in there. There's a beloved child of God in there. There's a promise in there. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you always. I am the good shepherd. I can give you a hundred of them. And man, we need those. We need those. You're not just what your brokenness is. That capacity of, re of redemption is big. I am a redeemed child of God. Stand up with me and say this. This is who I am. Say that. This is who I am. Amen. You can sit back down. Isaiah 63 says this, and he will provide for those like us tonight who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning. Here's the thing, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So God is saying, man, he's coming up to you tonight and he's going, I see your coat of, I see your coat of wreckage you're wearing around. I see your wrecked coat you're wearing around. I see the stuff you carrying around that you have on your shoulders. That's some kind of coat. Here's the thing, man. Will you trade me coats? I got a brand new coat for you. Can I have yours? If I can have your coat that's just absolutely crushing you tonight, I'm gonna give you one that's gonna set you free. I'm gonna give you a coat that's gonna set you free. And man, this is what I know. Get back up because this is who I am. Get up for that. This is who I am. Amen. You're wearing that coat. We are wearing new coats tonight. It doesn't get better than that. And it does. It does fit you. It does fit you, and it does belong to you. Not because I say that, because Jesus says that. It's his coat, it's his fit, and he knows what size you wear. 
Psalm 139 says it like this, for you have created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because, here's the thing, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And, and what this guy is saying is, God, you know what I'm figuring out is I'm one of them. I'm like one of your works. And I know that full well. What do I know full well? I know that this God of ours, this Jesus of ours, started working on me before I was ever me. Loved me enough to work on me before I was ever me. Before anybody ever looked at the little screen and said, yep, it's gonna be a girl, or yep, it's gonna be a boy. Knew that right now. Knew that right now. Before I ever did. Before they ever did. Was paying attention to me before I was ever born. Listen to that. Made you exactly the way you are. Not, not in your brokenness, but in your freedom. When Jesus sees you tonight, he is imagining you with his garment of praise on you. On you. Man, that's big stuff. And this is is who I am. You know what you're going to do? This is who I am. Let's go. This is who I am. Jesus said it like this. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and they will come. We will come and make our home with each of them. Man, are, are you... That's out of John 14. Are you hearing this? Jesus wants to come into your life and take up residence in you. You are worth so much that despite what you think of you and how you see you, he wants to come and live inside of your life. And you're like, well, man, listen, I mean, I gotta clean it up a little bit before that. And Jesus is like, I'm right here. I'm ready. I got my stuff to move in. I got my bag full of love, full of grace, full of serenity, full of hope, full of a future. I got my bag full. I'm ready to come in. I'm ready to unpack. I'm ready to show you how to do life in a way you've never imagined it. You know what? You know what? That, that is who I am. That might not believe who you believe you are. That is who you are. Jesus is here tonight to declare that. And, and I'm telling you, if, if that just seems like a bizarre idea that you would be a beloved child of God, that you would have a hope and a future, that you would be offered tonight a garment of praise that is fit just for you, that Jesus would literally sit here tonight and exchange your life. There's an opportunity. Most of us in, most of us in this room our biggest problem in getting sober with whatever it is, eating, drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, whatever it is, codependency, we're gonna keep working hard on those babies until we actually believe that we deserve to be sober. We're not gonna get there. Until we believe we deserve to be sober, we're not gonna get there. We, you can't treat sobriety like you won the lottery. You know, this isn't luck, this is willingness. This is willingness. People aren't lucky that get sober, they're willing. We gotta be willing to allow ourselves to believe that we deserve to get sober. And then you're like, man, I frankly don't believe that. I mean, he says that, I don't believe it. All right, fine. You know what? Here's the deal. Fake it till you make it. Walk around for a few weeks ago. Jesus says, Jesus actually believes <laughs> that I deserve to get sober. 
So instead of the fact of me believing myself and what I think I'm worth, for the next few weeks, I'm gonna live with Jesus' set of values and I'm gonna walk around this world believing that Jesus believes that I deserve to be sober, that I deserve to be free, that I deserve to be healthy. And I'm gonna stop worrying about what I think about me and I'm gonna think about what he thinks about me. And when I look in the mirror in the morning, I'm gonna think about what the way he sees me. See, that's what it's like when you realize that you need a savior. Is tonight, what this is all about is, I need to save my, I actually need a savior to save me from me. Isn't that the toughest thing we face? Who's gonna save me from me? His name is Jesus. We're gonna sing our last song tonight and we're gonna open up, we're gonna make this place in front of me an altar. And when we do that, it's an incredible time for you to step on up here, get down on your knees and just say, Jesus, you know what? I'm gonna choose for the next two weeks to live out of the way you see me. Like I need you in my life. I need to believe you. I need to hear from you and I need, I need to have you put your garment of praise on me. And I'm telling you, if you're willing to let him do that, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen tonight. It's gonna happen tonight. This altar is open. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.